Thank you, Anna, for inviting us to keep our hearts and minds focused on the Holy Spirit God, because Jesus said where two or three are gathered in his name, the presence of God's Holy Spirit will be there. So welcome to worship, friends. It's great to see so many of you in the house of God, and thank you for being here. We are so grateful for those of us who are joining uh, via, via Facebook. We are so glad that we can be in the house of God, even through technology. So thank you so much to Cheryl and Anna, uh, who are leading us in worship today. We also are grateful to our tech team, Andy and Greg and Paul, uh, Julie and JJ and Cheryl. Uh, we are so glad for our church family. In fact, just wave at somebody that you have seen after a week or so. Just wave at each other, say hi, because uh, the human touch is what we always, as as those who love God, are always looking for. So thank you for being in the house of God. Uh, we also want to celebrate uh, the joy uh, of the birth of uh, Georgia Jean Dare to Shane and Adeline, Addie as we call her. Grandparents are Kathy and and George, there is a rosebud <clears throat> on the altar that uh, we are celebrating the joy of children. Also, we want to thank God for the uh, altar flowers that are given by Rich and Lori Woodard. Thank you so much for furnishing the flowers to beautify the sanctuary. And if you are thinking about sponsoring a radio broadcast, maybe one or two families, if you'd like to, I yeah, would like uh, to offer that to you so that our homebounds and shut-in residents can also have the joy of listening to the radio as we do. I'll invite uh, Anna back again as we open our hearts as we are in the spirit of worship, as she will lead us with the heart of worship, the heart of worship. Very, very thankful for 
the joy of having Anna with us. Anna goes back to college this coming week, so we are grateful for her ministry to us. Thank you so much for sharing your gifts and also for the joy of being in worship together. Friends, uh, if you'd like to text your prayer requests, you can text them to me at 731-514-1946. 731-514-1946. We will lift them up in the house of God. Would you join with me for a moment of prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, today we come to you as the disciples came, as those who are hungry to hear your voice and your word. We pray, O oh God, because all glory is yours, because Christ, you are the Holy One. You are the one who invites us into worship. We thank you for placing us in the church, the body of Christ. Thank you for giving us the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that, O oh God, that you would guide us in these difficult, strange, and unique days. Help us to be the body of Christ that becomes stronger to serve you and also to serve our neighbors. Help us to persevere in the face of fear, temptation, and all the things that keep coming into our lives. Help us, O oh God, not to be like Peter who denied you at times. Help us to be as those who will stand for you and declare that you are the Christ. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Help us to repent and lead us back to you and our friends and our neighbors and our fellow citizens. Keep us, O oh God, on the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and those who are watching online in the comfort of their homes or wherever they are. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us, strengthen us, and guide us for this journey. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone say, Amen. Our call to invitation is uh, recorded in Romans chapter 12. I'm going to share with you verses 1 to 8. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. These are the words of the Apostle Paul to the church. It's an invitation for us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. Great invitation for us, the body of Christ. As we are thinking about Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, the one who is inviting us on this spiritual journey, as even as we think about how Christ is inviting us, because in Christ alone we stand, in Christ alone is our rock, and in Christ alone is our foundation. And I will lead us in Christ alone.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. In Christ we stand. I invite you to bring your joys or cares or concerns. I am looking at my phone. I have a couple of texts that I have received, and I will share them with you as also some of the prayers that you might like to lift up. Any joys or concerns in the house of God this, mor- this evening? I know I have Betty's joy, but you can go ahead and Betty share that. Well, Betty has shared this with with us this evening. We were praying for her son, John Dink, who had a blockage in his heart. And uh, she is praising God because his heart and body rerouted the carotid artery around itself. And the miracle of prayer that we were lifting up, the doctors are surprised. The doctor is saying that this is a miracle. Even the blockage was inoperable. So... Betty thanks God for for answered prayers. And now that he's home, that's what she just shared with us. The cardiologists cannot believe what they're seeing in, in what God has done in his life. So we thank God for answered prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other joys or concerns in the house of God? Uh, well, I have a text message that I received from JJ, who's at our radio station. Uh, JJ shares with, with us that he got hit by a drunk driver on Friday and he was going up for work. By the grace of God, I walked away without a scratch. And then he says, he got a ride back to do my broadcast. Please pray for the lady who hit me, who has been in the hospital with injuries. So JJ thanks God for safety and for prayers. So Lord in your mercy, hear our prayers. Also Nancy Ziprick has sent us a text that she is doing well at home and she is recovering and she is praying for God's uh, healing upon her, continued healing. So she's just thanking God for, for all the prayers. Please thank our church family this weekend for their cards, their our phone calls, flowers, and their prayers. I am healing and feeling better every day. She's got a smiley face in there. And she's uh, sending us her love and her prayers and thanks. Also, we, we are grateful to God for children. Uh, the, as you see the rosebud up there in the altar space, uh, the gift of uh, Georgia Jean Dare uh, to Shane and Adeline. Uh, we are so happy for Kathy and George, we pray that God's grace and strength and also those sleepless nights for for newborn babies, parents, we pray for them as well. Uh, Also other prayer requests, Diane Borger's daughter Chrissy and family are in California, are asked to prepare to evacuate due to the wildfires. So we pray for Christy, uh, that is Diane Borger's uh, family. Uh, Kathy Dare also thanks God for the surgery for her sister, that went well. We were praying for her as well. Continued prayers for Roberta Olson, uh, who's at Park Point, and Lorna Hardman also, who's at Park Point, waiting for uh, doctor's advice. Marcy Reinierson sends her love and prayers. She's back home. Pray for Janice Russell, who's at the hospital with health issues. We are also praying for Donna Babcock uh, as she awaits the results of some tests. Tom Zuriak is back home. I had a joy of speaking to him. Uh, Cheryl and Tom, thank God for our church family. We are praying for these, our dear ones. Continued prayers for Declan, uh, Tom and Sue Hall's grandnephew. And Twyla's son, Todd Wicker, is also getting back slowly with all the help that he can. Special prayers for students, for teachers, for those who are going back to school, for the teachers' aides, for bus drivers, for instructors, for professors, for teaching assistants, and even for the security and safety of the health officials who are going to be taking care of the school year. Pray for wisdom for our leaders. We are also praying for uh, the, 
the, the family of Becky Thomas. Her dad, Doug Hartford, had a life celebration uh, on their farm this past week. Uh, Becky thanks the church family for the support, prayers, cards, and every gift that we have shared with the family. Friends, we believe in a prayer answering God. So I invite you to bring your silent prayers and leave them at the throne of grace. <clears throat> Gracious God, we are so blessed to be called daughters and sons of the Most High God. We are thankful for your hand of protection, provision, and your presence in our lives. We are grateful for all with which you have blessed us even till this day. We thank you for what you have done in the past, what you are doing now, and will continue to do in our lives, bringing miracles bringing the gift of children and the joy of family, the family of God. We thank you for our students and our teachers. We pray even as the school year unfolds with so much of uncertainty, we pray for your presence. We pray for your wisdom. We ask, O oh Christ, that you would be with all those who are sharing, caring for each other during these days. We pray for our dear ones who are at the retirement home. We pray for those who are awaiting results for their tests. We ask that your hand and your voice would be upon us, reminding us, my daughter, my son, I love you and I care for you. We pray for comfort for those who've lost loved ones around the world. We pray for those who are, oh God, struggling with this pandemic, for those who have lost lives. I pray for friends and family around the world who mourn with us today wherever they are, Pray especially on a personal note for our dear uncle in, in London, Mr. Thacker, who passed away yesterday. We pray for peace for his uh, children who are spread around the world and even here in Dallas, Texas. Watch over these dear ones as they make the plans to travel. Guide your children, O oh God, everywhere. That you would be our guide, you would be the light, and we will follow in your footsteps. With thanksgiving, we ask, O oh God, that you would bless these prayers. Receive them. Answer us. And we know that we believe in the power of prayer. And you asked us, cast all your burdens on me, for I care for you. So with the assurance and the confidence that we are the children of God, we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we worship a God who gives generously, without measure, shaken, pressed down, and overflowing into our lives. At this time, we are grateful for all of us who are here. The offering baskets are in the, in the center of the sanctuary. You're welcome to. Uh, and also, we thank God for those who give generously through the banking system and also through the mail. We, if you'd like to send an offering to the church, our address is 118 West Jackson Street, Morris, Illinois. May God bless you as you give, as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above each heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. O 
Oh God, we are so blessed. Words fail to describe the gratitude and thanks of our hearts. We are blessed with food, clothing, and shelter. We are blessed by your ever-abiding presence, constantly providing for all our needs according to your riches and glory. Bless your children. Bless them with all good and perfect gifts. Open the windows of heaven, O God, and pour out a blessing that we will be, in turn, a blessing to the world that is in need. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Friends, our scripture is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. I'll share with you the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. When Jesus came into the district of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you because you are our Lord, our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Albert Steinberg, writing sometime back in the Saturday Evening Post, went on to explain about a small disc on the Meads Ranch in north central Kansas where the 39th parallel from the Atlantic to the Pacific crosses the 98th meridian running from Canada all the way to Rio Grande. The National Oceanic Survey, a small federal agency whose business it is to locate the exact positions of every point in the United States, uses the scientifically recognized reference point on the Meads Ranch. So far, no mistakes have been made, and none are expected. All ocean liners and commercial planes come under their survey. The government can build no dams or even launch a missile without this agency to tell it the exact location to the very inch. It is called Location by Approximation is the title of that article. But then it continues to say, Location by Approximation can be costly and dangerous. That is why there is so much of chaos in our society today. Everyone's using their own reference point. What we need is a universal reference point so that we can say, here, here is how the good life is lived. For Christians, there is such a reference point, and that reference point is Jesus Christ. What would Jesus do? You know, remember, we used to wear those bracelets, we used to wear those little uh, badges. It was, a way, it was and is a very popular slogan and theme 
that has been here for over many decades. But in the postmodern world and the culture that is looking and wanting more substance, relevance, and coherence, it has become critically important to ask the question that piggybacks on what would Jesus do to what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? That is the question that continually helps us in our quest for right living. Let's take a moment to contrast between these two questions. What would Jesus do? And what did Jesus do? Both have merits, mind you, and they demand an answer. What would Jesus do? Has somewhat lost its significance as it permitted and allowed people to have a subjective approach and personal interpretation. It enables folks to color it as per one's own convenience, suit their preferences, and draw their own conclusions rather than understand, comprehend the vital, critical, and life-altering invitation of what did Jesus do. In this passage from Matthew 16, which I read to you, verses 13 to 20, Jesus turned it around by asking two pertinent questions. There are two levels on which Jesus is having this conversation with the disciples. One, who do people say the Son of God is? And after the disciples give a very descriptive, historical, sociological, and comparative answer, stating the names of, you are John the Baptist, that's what people say. Some say you are Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. On hearing this, Jesus asked them a personal, invasive, and soul-searching question, who do you say I am? Some people see things differently, one may say, which is generally so, and it is rightfully so. For example, three people, a minister, an archaeologist, and a cowboy, were getting their first look at the Grand Canyon. Any of you have been to the Grand Canyon? It's a, it's a beautiful site. It's one of those amazing sites. So they were there all together at the same time. So the minister exclaimed, truly, this is one of the glories of God. The archaeologist commented, what a wonder of nature this is. And then the cowboy, standing at the edge of one of those places, looked and said, can you imagine trying to find a lost steer in there, people see things differently. The backdrop and the context in which we find ourselves in this passage is that Jesus and his disciples have ventured out into the district of Caesarea Philippi. It's an area about 25 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee, and the region had tremendous religious implications. The place was littered with temples, of the Syrian gods. Here also was the elaborate marble temple that was erected by Herod the Great, father of the then ruling Herod Antipas. Here also was the influence of the Greek gods. Here also was a place and altar for worship of Caesar as God himself. You might say that the world religions were on display in this town. That's why Jesus took the disciples. It was this scene as the backdrop that Jesus chose to ask two critical questions in his earthly ministry. He looked at the disciples and in a moment of reflection said, who do people say that I am? The disciples shared with Jesus what they have heard from the people. They, they, the people were following him and they were hearing comments. Some were saying, oh, this is Elijah. No, this is John the Baptist. No, this is Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So there was a constant following by the masses who saw Jesus differently. Some can speak of Jesus as a prophet, a holy man, a teacher, or a spiritual guru. And few will object in our world today. Very few will object if you say, Jesus is a prophet, a holy man, a teacher, or a spiritual guru but speak of him as the Son of God, divine, and of course, one with the Father, and people will line up to express their disapproval, disagreements, debates, 
disputes and differences. Who is Jesus? If you ask one billion people in India, they will say, Jesus is one of the three billion gods and goddesses they worship. A billion Muslims around the world will say, prophet, yes, God, no. Jews who are scattered around the world will say, teacher, yes, Messiah, no. Christian religionists of various stripes will say, Jesus was an exemplary man, yes. Divine, not sure. So these two questions are pertinent to us who call and claim ourselves Christians. Who do people say Jesus is? And who do you say Jesus is? And maybe also add another question for us as those who are following Jesus. What did Jesus do and what are we called to do? What did Jesus do and what are we called to do? Let's look at these three questions very briefly. The first question is Jesus asking them, who do people say that I am? It's a critical moment in the life of our Lord. He was at the end of the ministry. He's going towards Jerusalem and he's taken his disciples on a detour and he's also under the watchful eyes of the Pharisees, the Sadducees and other religious authorities who are beginning to assess who this man is. Did they now understand who Jesus was? Were they, all his efforts fruitful or had it all been in vain? It's a critical moment and critical moments call for critical questions. Who do people say that I am? The disciples, as we've heard, they were thinking about Elijah. Now, who was Elijah? He was a prophet. The Israelites knew that he lived a religious life. He was the one who challenged the prophets of Baal at the top of Mount Carmel. And we know, even as little children, that he was the one who called fire from heaven. And then the offering that he had laid out was consumed by God's fire. And then they talk about Jesus when he took the disciples out on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah came to minister him. So here is how they were understanding who this Jesus is. And some said that he was John the Baptist's return. Remember, Herod had beheaded John, and then his death soon turned into martyrdom, and John's popularity began to flourish even as Jesus was continuing his ministry. John the Baptist was the first prophet who came on the scene 400 years after there was this huge silence. So while all these names and these people were receiving wild acceptance among the masses, many were baptized by John. If you look at Jesus' own baptism, they were, John was baptizing in the river Jordan. Then as the disciples were telling Jesus, he's saying, yes, but who do you say that I am? Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, it's all fine, but who do you say that I am? So they were thinking about Jesus as you and I read the Gospels. Jesus is declared as the son of David. Remember when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He is the son of God, the divine physician, the king, the prophet, the bridegroom, the light of the world, the door, the true wine, the high priest, and the firstborn of creation, the bright and morning star, the alpha and omega. All these were attempts to answer the question that Jesus posed. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am. There were many attempts to describe who Jesus was. But then Jesus made this question a very important question. He said to them, who do you, do you say that I am? If you read verse 17 and verse 16, Simon Peter answered Jesus and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah the son of the living God. This is a very important declaration of Peter that we have to grapple with today. The question is, who is Jesus to you? In this pandemic, in this fear, psychosis, in the news that keeps going back and forth, in all the things that we are caught up in, who is Jesus Christ to you? Peter is saying, 
You are, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, but my Father in heaven. The work of the Holy Spirit is in the heart of God. You and I are very valuable to God. You and I are always asked this question. How is it with your soul? Who is Jesus Christ to us? The third question that comes directly to us is, what are we do to do with what Christ is calling us to as the church? Jesus gives Peter the keys to the kingdom. Look at this passage. And Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, the rock. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Friends, you and I have the keys to the kingdom. If we have the right answer to the two questions that Jesus posed to his disciples... Peter, as you know, went on to be one of the most powerful evangelists around the world. He went all the way to Rome. He preached in the Colosseum. He stood there in front of Nero while he had the games that were being held. He even stood up there and declared that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Peter is the rock on which you and I are in our faith and that affirmation is based on. Peter is given this word on the rock. I will build my church. This was the greatest confession that anyone could ever make on the face of the earth. When I was 17 years old, a friend of mine who always loved to ask questions about faith, my beliefs and my convictions, always said, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? How did you find Jesus Christ? He was a nominal Christian who went to church. He attended Sunday school and, never came, and even came to youth camps. It was a pertinent question from someone I knew since my middle school days. He was a dear friend of mine. And he used to call me all kinds of nicknames because I, when the church doors opened, we were there. Our family was there. So he used to call me Preacher, Holy Joe, and you know some of the names that they call you too. Because I used to lead singing during the services. I used to be a part of the Sunday school. I taught Sunday school. And then I also led the youth fellowship. So it was a genuine question, and I had to answer him. And incidentally, his name is Paul, and that was more important for me to answer him. How would I describe, how would I describe whether I was found by God? But I told Paul, God found me. I was searching. I was lost. I did not have a meaning and purpose to life. And I told him that Jesus is my good shepherd, that Jesus never ceases to look for those who are lost. And as to how God sent Jesus Christ into this world to love me and to love the people around me. And that I am a sinner in need of a savior. And then I offered my life because of his sacrifice on the cross that his blood was shed for my sin. And then there is an empty tomb and the third day God raised him from the dead. And I further told him that I was lost. I was lost without my Savior. And then when I asked Christ to come into my life, He made me a new creature. That was December 14th, 1978, at a Christmas youth gathering on the edge of a basketball court. I knelt and I prayed and I asked God to forgive me my sins and made me His own. And that is the day that peace and joy and hope and new birth and life has been different for me. Friends, there are great things that you and I can do for the kingdom of God. You and I have to come to a point where we echo that question in our years. Who do you say that I am? The words of Jesus and the answer of Peter. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Your life will never be the same again. Even the woman at the well, she came to Jesus. Even Mary Magdalene came to Jesus. Paul the one who was called Saul, who was actually involved in persecuting the church, became a new person. Martin Luther became a new person. John Wesley, Mother Teresa, 
and the names and the lists go on. Even many of you sitting here today can vouch for that, that Jesus Christ is Lord. The question that we have to answer is, what is God wanting us to do in these times? Because people are afraid. Our neighbors might be looking to ask you that question. They might be asking you the question, why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you go out and declare your faith by being a part of the worship weekend after weekend? The Bible says, For what shall it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange of their soul? John, in John's letter, the first letter, chapter 5, says, This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, that whoever has the Son, Jesus, has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. In John's Gospel, these are the words of Jesus. John 5, 24. Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. And hear these words, does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Death to life. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens their heart's door, I will come in and live with them. Friends, I invite you for a moment of silence and prayer. As you ask yourself this question, yes, what does the world think about Jesus? Who do people say that I am? Well, everyone is entitled to an opinion, to an affirmation. But the question is, who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Who do you say Jesus Christ is? Is he a teacher? Is he a guru? Is he the son of God? If you have never asked Christ to come into your life, friends, he is the son of God who came to us, who showed us the way, and he continues to lead us on that journey. If you have never asked Christ to come into your life, I'll invite Anna to come and sing the song, Your Name. It's the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, that can forgive us our sins, that can give freedom, liberty, and also grant us eternal joy and peace, not only here on the face of the earth, but in the life to come. It's the name of Jesus that invites you, beckons you, and calls you. Will you say yes to Christ tonight?
is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder there's nothing as the power to save but your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your Scripture says, friends, Scripture says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is no name given under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Thank you, Anna, for blessing us and inviting us, friends. Remember the name of Jesus. Now go forth from this place. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may that name of Jesus open doors. May the name of Jesus bring healing. May the name of Jesus be a strong and mighty tower. May the name of Jesus be your guide when you are afraid. Go forth from this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Well, friends, a few announcements that uh, Tuesday uh, we'll have the Stevens Ministry at 6 o'clock and Wednesday the Bible Boot Camp at 10 a.m. And Wednesday, uh, beg your pardon, uh, the Bible Boot Camp at 9 a.m. And at 10 a.m. we have a phone-in prayer service. If you'd like to join in, you're welcome. The number to call is 425-436-6371 and the PIN number is 241-755. If you'd like to join us for a very quiet, solemn time of prayer with communion on Wednesdays, uh, last week we had the joy of two little children along with their parents come and share with us in this beautiful time of being together and breaking bread. You're welcome at 5.30 on Wednesdays and at 7 p.m. our men's study group will be meeting and uh, next Saturday we'll have our worship at 5.30 and Sunday our service at 9 a.m. Friends, we are so grateful. Also, the Watercolors Guild is meeting on Fridays at 1 o'clock. So we are opening our church to things that need to be done. I know that we are all looking for that day when everyone can be here, but God is going to make that happen. Go forth. Have a blessed and a peaceful evening and a restful weekend. Go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.